Welcome. Today I want to talk about some disturbing news about shape-shifting animals in a climate crisis. The barrage of news all began with the, the publication of a so-called scientific paper called Shape-Shifting, Changing Animal Morphologies as a Response to Climate Warming. As expected, the Guardian picked it up and amplified it as the animal shape-shifting in response to a climate crisis. And all its affiliated uh, members of the Climate Desk and other independent news agencies have jumped on the story as well. Now the term shape-shifting is real popular uh, amongst the horror scientific uh, fiction movies. But for real scientists, we like to refer to such changes as diversification in adaptive radiation. It's a natural and vital part of all biological processes. And it's exemplified very well by bird species on remote islands. As the case of Madagascar's vangas, uh, we, we're not sure if there was one group of ancestors or a couple different colonization events, but it's led to a, a whole adaptive radiation of very different birds that are endemic just to this island. So you, you get birds like the helmeted uh, vanga to a, 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 the beak of the sickle cell beak vanga. So you have small warbler eating beaks and, and thicker seed eating beaks. So uh, this happens very naturally. Another classic example is Hawaii's honey creepers. And probably less than 4 million years ago, some colonists found their way to these distant ocean islands and again could exploit these resources that no other animals were exploiting. And so their beaks evolved into many different shapes to allow them to probe for nectar, act like a woodpecker, eat seeds, eat insects, etc. Finally, the group of birds that most uh, freshman biologists learn about to understand adaptive radiation is Darwin's finches of the Galapagos Islands. Now, Darwin himself, when he first came across these birds, was fooled into thinking they represented species from very different families. And that was justifiable because most families of birds have very distinct bills. You have very thin bills of hummingbirds, you have the hooked bills of a, of a raptor, a hawk for ripping flesh, you have a stout bill of a woodpecker, etc. But it turns out that a flock of a single species uh, was the single ancestors of, of all these different birds. And we know this from genetic analysis. They probably arrived about two million years ago. Now, many of these birds have been studied by biologists and especially this uh, medium-sized ground finch that we're going to look at here. And w this was the focus of the paper that puts this shape-shifting paper that all the media is agog about. Now, to give some background to these Galapagos finches is to understand that the Galapagos Islands are situated off the coast of South America at about the equator. And their climate will vary between very wet and very dry periods because it's heavily impacted by different El Nino and La Nina events. Now, one species of Darwin's finch, the medium-sized ground finch, has attracted the attention of many researchers, especially because it consists of two morphs, a large beaked morph and a small beaked morph. And their proportion varies between El Nino and La Nina events. If you want to appreciate what very good biologists do to understand how the word world works, I suggest you read 40 Years of Evolution by the Grants. They looked at all the possible variables that would affect the adaptive radiation amongst Darwin's finches. In particular, they noticed for the medium ground finch that during wet El Nino years, the wetness induces a flush of growth where it can turn a desert into a lush grassland with many small seeded plants. 
and then the small beak bird morphs increase. In contrast, during dry La Niña's, it's mostly large seeds from more deeply rooted plants that can survive, and that favors a growth in the large beak birds with a decrease in the small beak birds. Furthermore, they notice that there can be this competition with larger beak birds that will outcompete the, the large beak morph and cause the large beaks to, to decline and, the, and give a greater proportion to the smaller beak birds. So all these have an effect of this changing fluctuation in beak size. Now the shape-shifting paper that got worldwide attention did not focus on all these well-studied ecological variables that cause birds to, to change the shape of their bills. Instead, they just focused on a relationship between temperature and beaks. What they've noticed is seen here in this thermograph of a medium-sized ground finch is that a large beak can radiate away more heat as seen in the, in the brighter yellows. Also, their legs can radiate more heat because the feathers covering the rest of the body sort of insulate the heat. And what the authors uh, raised for fear is they suggested that the smaller beak morphs were not going to be able to radiate away enough heat as the climate crisis uh, continues, and they're not going to survive as well as the larger beak birds. And they feared that the large beak birds might not be able to grow big enough uh, beaks fast enough in order to survive, uh, which is a, a little shaky, especially when you see the correlation coefficient that they have. The R squared is only 0 0.01. That means that their correlation that they uh, are pushing only accounts for 1% of all the different variations that happen within this bird. Now, the shape-shifting authors focused on uh, what a freshman ecologist uh, would learn about Allen's rule. And basically, all that was saying is that some species will have smaller appendages, ears or, or legs, where it's very cold in order to conserve heat. In contrast, where it's warm and you have to dissipate heat, the, those animals will have larger appendages and it uh, allow to radiate more heat away. And the classic example is what you see here is a, of the jackrabbit. And it's true if you look at all the members of this genus, the lepus, that their size of their ears will correlate with temperature. However, if you look at the related uh, bunnies, the silvagus, that what you'll see here is that the studies there show that the size of the ears do not correlate. So there's other factors involved, there's other genetic factors involved. Now, what would have been a, a more valuable uh, exercise for these shape-shifting authors to look at is look at other species. Are they suffering? Is their survival going down because they have small beaks? Well, if you look at hummingbirds, they have very small beaks, and if they got big beaks, they probably couldn't fly or get any more nectar. This is the ruby-throated uh, hummingbird that's very common in eastern United States. How has the global warming changed their populations? Well, we see since the 70s, they spiked up and through the 90s. They've come down a little, but they're still far more abundant than they ever used to be. That tells you that global warming is not causing their survival to diminish. The west coast of the United States, where you have Anna's hummingbirds, I have some in my backyard. How well are they doing with global climate change? Well, their numbers are continuing to rise as it has benefited them. So again, this argument that uh, we have a correlation between warmer temperatures and bigger beaks, it's true, big beaks can uh, radiate more heat, but it doesn't mean that a smaller beak is causing you to uh, not survive as well. Most of these uh, bogus horror stories blaming a climate crisis are based on simple correlations that really do not hold up to the reality of what is happening. Correlation is not causation. For example, here's a correlation between people eating less margarine and fewer divorces in Maine. Or here's an example of 
increased scientific spending that's correlated with an increase in uh, suicides by strangulation and suffocation. Now, the rise in CO2 has a very nice straight. We're, um, undoubtedly, we're adding more CO2 to the environment. But is it causing this crisis? Well, any change that correlates with the same upward trend, you can blame on CO2. It doesn't mean it's happening. It's just a correlation. And even the authors of this shape-shifting paper admitted that despite global warming being this compelling argument because they're all the media is pushing a crisis it is difficult to establish causality so let's pretend that this narrative uh, that if animals cannot dissipate heat quick enough they're going to have a lower survival due to this climate crisis well, in this case, you can look at humans, and here's a thermograph of humans, and you can see uh, we radiate more heat with the red spots, and where our head is covered with hair, we radiate less heat. And that means that uh, this climate crisis might affect women uh, disproportionately. If they have more hair, they're going to uh, trap more heat, and they're going to lower their survival. Of course, they could shave their heads. Now, this climate crisis narrative and shape-shifting is providing new insights for other issues that have been plaguing humans. For example, male pattern baldness has been increasing, and researchers have blamed uh, pollution, poor diet, heavy stress. But if we look at it from a climate crisis point of view, these men are just adapting to greater global heating. Furthermore, we should ask the FDA to put a warning tag on all toupees because men who are adding toupees to cover up their bald spot are reducing their ability to uh, radiate heat away from their body and thus are lessening their survival. And finally, hopefully humans can adapt quick enough for this overheating, but it tells us that what we are going to shapeshift into is something like Yoda with bigger ears and a bald head to dissipate heat. Well, I personally take these shape-shifting climate horror stories as very laughable and not based in any sound science whatsoever. But it bothers me that people are framing natural diversity changes and turning it into a climate crisis narrative and the only reason that makes sense to do something like that is they're trying to manipulate us into uh, accepting their political agendas. Well, up next will be growing Pacific islands and stable sea levels. Until then, embrace the renowned scientist Thomas Huxley's advice that skepticism is the highest of duties and blind faith are one unpardonable sin. And if you appreciate the science clearly presented here, science, science rarely presented in and obscured by mainstream media, then please give this a like, share it with as many people as you can, subscribe to my channel, or read my book, Landscapes and Cycles, An Environmentalist Journey to Climate Skepticism. Thank you.